Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture. We are a non-profit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This presentation and many others are available through our online library at instituteofcatholicculture.org and on our ICC app. Please view our upcoming schedule of live online events and engage with us on social media. For handouts, links, and further study materials, please visit this program's page on our website or app. Blessed is our God at all times, both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. O you who have granted us to pray together in harmony, and who promised that when two or three are gathered to call upon your name, you will give what they ask. Do you now fulfill what your servants ask, so far as it is good, granting us in this world the knowledge of your truth, and in the world to come, eternal life? For you are good, O our God, and you love mankind, and we render glory to you, to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is risen. Indeed, he is risen. Christos Anesti. Alithos Anesti. <laughs> Welcome, Dr. Papino. Good to have you here. Kelsey, go ahead and introduce our speaker this evening. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Father Hezekiah. Our speaker this evening is a professor of Greek, Latin, history, and patristics at Our Lady of Guadalupe Seminary in Denton, Nebraska. He has a master's degree in classical Greek and Latin, and his doctorate is in the Fathers of the Church. He has published on the Fathers of the Church and on contemporary church history, particularly Vatican II in the liturgy in the 20th century. His most recent publication is Death Comes for the Cathedrals, a translation of Marcel Proust's 1904 lament that the cathedrals of France might no longer house the liturgy for which they were built. Dr. John Papino has taught many courses and lectures for the Institute of Catholic Culture and for our Magdala Apostolate. And it is such a joy to welcome back to the Institute, Dr. Papino. Welcome, Doctor. Thank you. And it's really good to be back. I think I see some familiar faces, some new faces. I know, yes, Martin and Elsa, of course, are always faithfully present. It's good to see your cheery faces again. Now, let's get into the meat of what we're talking about, ecumenical council. So quick preliminary. First of all, what is an ecumenical, what does ecumenical mean? I know many of you have know this, but I'll tell you anyway. It, it's from the a Greek word ekumene, which means the thing we live in, basically, the lived-in land. In other words, it means uh, wherever people live, that's where ecumen ecumenicalism, I guess, or ecumenicity is. In other words, these councils are meant to represent, to the extent possible, the entirety of the church, and normally... It's composed of the bishops, and sometimes other people show up too, as we'll see. Sometimes it can be very limited and cozy and intimate. Sometimes these councils, as we shall see, were gigantic circuses where everyone came along and uh, put tried to put pressure on bishops. Now, as you know, there have been 21 such ecumenical councils in the history of the church so far. In the last series, we dealt with the first seven, which were really the councils that set in stone what the church has always and had always believed, really about our Lord Jesus Christ and the Trinity and all these foundational doctrines. So we saw Nicaea 325 about the co-eternity and consubstantiality of the Son with the Father. We saw the first council of Constantinople which expanded the church's definition of the Trinity to the Holy Ghost and put an end to other heresies and finally put a nail in the coffin of those who rejected that Christ was fully God. The Council of Ephesus, 431, that declared Mary to be the mother of God. The Council of Chalcedon, that said that there were two separate natures in Christ, divine and human. The Second Council of Constantinople, Against those, against the three chapters and Nestorianism, we had kind of come back again. The Third Council of Constantinople, against a weird heresy with a strange name, monothelitism, that said that Christ incarnate had only one will. 
And then the second Council of Nicaea of 787 was the council at which the veneration of images and icons was defended. Now, in this series, so that was, um, that was the seventh. In this series, we're going to pick up from the 8th to the 21st. Tonight, we'll look at the 8th through the 15th council. It's going to have to go fast because that's as many councils as we saw in all three lectures the last time. So we'll have to go pretty quickly. And that will take us from Constantinople 4 in 869 to the council at Vienne, a town in France. Now, it's not Vienna in Austria in uh, 1311 to 1313. In other words, tonight we're looking at the medieval councils of the church. In a week, we'll look at really the Renaissance and Reform councils, that's 17 through 19. From Constance, which comes at 1431, that was a very messy council, to the Great Council of Trent that ends in 1563, which is one of the great and important councils. And one thing, one of the things we'll see, by the way, is that although all these councils are ecumenical, some of them are great and some of them are not so great. I don't mean to say that there's anything wrong with them, but they're, they're not quite as impactful in the life and thought and, and, uh, of the church. So second lecture will take us to Trent. And then lecture three, the modern councils, Vatican I, 1870, and Vatican II, 1962 to 1965, which in many ways will be the most difficult council to, to, to deal with and think about and talk about, simply because it's the one closest to us. And uh, so we, to some extent, lack the historian's detachment, although I will do my best. And if I seem partisan to you in any way, I'm sure you can catch me out or question me, and I kind of hope that you do. Now, a very quick reminder of what a council is and does and does not do. Now, when the bishops come together and the Pope has to convoke it or be involved in it and confirm it in some way, very often, although not always, it's because some point of doctrine in dispute. And the church needs to reaffirm the faith of the church in the face of innovation, that people have new ideas and they have to be told, no, you're going too far or that's wrong. But also, there are lots and lots of disciplinary issues that come up from, you know, how cardinals should dress to whether one can kneel at mass or to the way in which taxes are paid and to whom. It can, you can have this nitty gritty stuff that's really time bound. So that's so we have to kind of sift through councils from that point of view. There's doctrine promulgated solemnly. And then there's just the disciplinary stuff that can change from century to century. Not all the proceedings of councils are very edifying, by the way. And not all the decrees of every council are even prudent. Sometimes they, they come together, they have a disciplinary thing they come up with, and it turns out not to be a very good one. We'll see some examples of that. Sometimes the, the ideas on which they base what they promulgate or the canons they promulgate are not quite right. So like human life, it's a mixture. And yet, despite all of the uh, ambition and wrangling that takes place in councils, and these are not my words, that's uh, St. Gregory Nazianzen said, there's, oh, there's all this ambition and wrangling in this council. And he had presided over an ecumenical council himself, Constantinople, so he knew. And our dear Benedict XVI, the Pope Emeritus, quotes him and says, oh, councils can be messy. And yet, the Holy Ghost is there to guarantee the absence of any possible error in the doctrinal definitions in matters of faith and morals that these councils produce. So... The bishops and the Pope are not inspired by the Holy Ghost. No, no. They are preventing, prevented from saying something false when officially promulgating doctrine in matters of faith and morals. And so this, but I don't want to diminish the authority of councils either. Councils do have the highest and most solemn authority. They do impose universal disciplinary laws, which people have to obey. And they, as I said, pronounce themselves infallibly in matters of faith and morals. And this authority of the councils, by the way, 
of course, is not superior to the authority of the Pope. Although we're going to see plenty of medieval theologians who tried to say that a council was above a Pope. No, no. In fact, in many ways, it can be said that the authority of a council depends on the authority of the Pope. How? Well, he convokes it, or at least he confirms it, which is equivalent to convoking it. And also he can determine it. A Pope can say of a council that some of it must be accepted and some of it doesn't have to be. That could happen too. So let's dig in. Now, tonight, the medieval, and sometimes also they're called papal councils. Why papal? Because they were more immediately called by popes and because the popes played very often a very direct role in them. And the first of the councils we're watching tonight, and it kind of breaks my heart a little bit, is the first council that is not accepted by the Orthodox. This is Constantinople IV in 689. Then we'll look at what I call the literal, Little Lateran Councils. There are three councils more or less in a row. They all take place at the Lateran, which is the, the church in Rome, the St. John Lateran, and those are only disciplinary. So Lateran one, two, three. Then we'll look at Lateran four, which is one of the great councils that promulgates important doctrines. Then we'll look at the two councils that take place in the French city of Lyon, which were concerned with pretty much the same things, namely the fate of Christians in the Holy Land and reunion with the Greeks. And then the last of the councils we'll look at tonight, the one in 1311, that takes place in Vienne, which is a city really just south of Lyon, still in France, is the first council of the popes who lived no longer in Rome, but in the city inside of France called Avignon. And so that's where we'll end. We'll end at the point where the popes are no longer in Rome. They've left. They have a council, or the pope at the time has a council in France, and we'll see how that works out. And then they, they stay in Avignon in the south of France for another 67 years. So let's begin. I see time is flying. With Constantinople IV, the eighth council. So we're going to count them. Eight We'll make it to uh, 15. What was the cause of the Eighth Council, the Council in Constantinople for? It was really all about the rivalry between the Pope of Rome and the Patriarch of Constantinople, especially because now St. Cyril and Methodius have converted the Slavs. And the question was, well, who's going to have jurisdiction over these new Christians in Bulgaria, Moravia, and elsewhere? Is it going to be Rome or Constantinople? And St. Cyril and Methodius although they were sent into the Slavic lands by the Byzantines, St. Cyril, at least, on one of his trips, missionary trips, went to Rome and was made bishop by the Pope. So they collaborated in kind of sending them out, and each of them wants those Slavs. And the Popes have taken a keen interest in Bulgaria. In fact, Pope St. Nicholas the Great had written a long uh, a work called Responses to the Questions of the Bulgarians, because these new Christians were asking questions, and the Pope is the one who answered them. Now, so that's the rivalry. The event that precipitates things is that there's a new patriarch in Byzantium whose name is Ignatius. And Ignatius speaks truth to power. He got in trouble with the emperor. He refused to give communion to the emperor's uncle who had a concubine or incest or something. And so the, the emperor, who was called Michael the Drunkard, okay, kicks out Ignatius and installs in his stead the librarian of the cathedral of the cathedral of the Patriarchate of Constantinople. So he picks, you know, someone who can be relied upon to be somewhat mousy and soft-spoken and not really ambitious. And in this, he was perfectly wrong, because this librarian, whose name was Phocius, was in fact quite ambitious and very clever and very learned. And so Ignatius' supporters organize a synod against Phocius. Phocius takes fright and he writes to the Pope saying, by the way, I'm the new patriarch, please confirm me. And uh, this is to St. Nicholas of Rome. St. Nicholas, who's a sharp man and who dealt with stronger men than this, smells a bit of a rat and sends delegates to Constantinople to sort out what's going on. They're intercepted by Phocius, who winds them, who dines them, who tells them to judge the case themselves. And they do in favor of Phocius. They get back to Rome. Nicholas is very unhappy with them and is even more convinced that Phocius is up to no good. So... 
a succession of local Roman synods. What is a synod? A synod is a simply is not an ecumenical council. It is simply a small regional council. And the popes had got into the habit, which lasts to this day, of having synods in Rome every so often, usually around Easter or in Lent. And often these Roman synods will provide the agenda for later ecumenical councils. This happened here because in 862, Nicholas has a Roman synod in which it reinstates Ignatius and deposes Photius. The next year, Pope St. Nicholas excommunicates Photius, who responds by attacking the Pope for heresy. What heresy? Well, he finds one. He's heard that recently in the creed in Western lands, they have been saying that the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father and the Son. And this in Latin is filioque, filio, son, son, and que means and, and son. And so he said, oh, I'll use that. That's new. It wasn't in the original creed. He's a heretic. And Nicholas says, okay, both of you come over to Rome. They don't. In 867, Photius holds a synod of his own in which he deposes the Pope of Rome. So bad blood all around. But then there's a coup. Now, and by the way, this is going to be a common theme tonight. In fact, for the next uh, three, this lecture and the next two, that councils and church history do not happen in the abstract on stained glass windows. It happens very much within the nitty gritty of human life. And what happens here is that there's a coup at the palace and a new man comes in, deposes the emperor and takes over in his stead and wants to replace everyone that that emperor had fostered, including Photius. So Photius is kicked out and Ignatius is reinstated by the emperor who seeks the collaboration of Rome. Now we have a new pope, Hadrian II, and this new Pope Hadrian confirms all that Nicholas had done. And along with this new emperor of Constantinople, they organize this ecumenical council to which Hadrian sends three legates. And it takes place in the Hagia Sophia. And all the Greeks are there. This is 869. It's a very big deal. And Photius is anathematized along with all of his followers. So in other words, it puts an end to Photius and his cronies. In addition to that, it deals with other things. It repeats the lawfulness of the veneration of icons, because canon number three does this. And by the way, there's another theme. A count, very often, and this is perfectly legitimate, councils will restate what former councils of, or popes have already said. There is a repetition that takes place when we need it. And Hadrian II also allowed for this, and this is a little bit new, but it's only disciplinary. It's the order of precedence among the patriarchs of the world. Until now, Rome, of course, always has precedence. Then it had been Alexandria and then Constantinople. And we saw, by the way, that there had been councils where the Greeks tried to put Constantinople second and the Pope rejected it. This time, Hadrian II says, yes, in order to reconcile all of you Constantinopolitan prelates, I grant that Constantinople is the second see after Rome. And that's essentially all that the council did. It, it dealt with some other heresies, minor heresies too, some disciplinary matters as well. But this council is nowhere to be found in the lists of council kept by the Byzantines even though it took place over there in their great church, Hagia Sophia. But in the West, we count it as the eighth. And so that's really where there's a bifurcation between East and West. Here's an epilogue. At the death of Ignatius, Photius is reinstated as patriarch, actually. He comes back. And he calls a council of his own in 879, so that's a decade later, to undo what Constantinople for did. And that council of Photius is what the Orthodox call the Eighth Council. They call that Constantinople IV, even though it's 10 years later and very different. What does Rome do? Rome does nothing. The Muslims are invading. They're going to take over Rome. The Carolingian Empire of Charlemagne and his descendants is falling apart, and they had been 
the great imperial house that always defended Rome, gone. Roman noble families are fighting over the papacy, trying to get their sons in there, they bribe people. We're entering now into what the great Renaissance post-Tridentine church historian called the Seculum Obscurum, the dark age of the church, because there are very few records. In other words, Rome and the papacy are falling into a period of decadence. We're entering into the period in which there are very young popes who are elected, well, this is the period in which popes or a pope is dug out of the ground to be condemned for his misalliance. Everything is falling apart. And so they, kind of, they say, okay, Fushis, you want to be a patriarch? Fine, we're busy. Meanwhile, the Greek church is going to do very well. This is, there's not going to be another council for 254 years. It's a long stretch of time. So if you consider the, the councils as the heartbeat of the church, the, the church is kind of on life support here for, for two and a half centuries. The Greeks are doing well, though, because this is the time when they evangelize the Russians, and that explains why the Church of Russia is, is aligned on Constantinople, not Rome. And there will be a dispute a couple of centuries later in 1054, which arises from jurisdictions, more jurisdictional stuff, and by that time, in 1054, the Greeks and the Romans have long since developed different disciplines and ways of talking about theology. So although we speak of 1054, you know, the mutual excommunication, so-called, as being the break, the actual break took place really in the late 9th century. 1054 merely made it even more formal. So that's the Eighth Council. And it's the last ecumenical council to take place in the Orient. 250 Four years later, we have a very different situation. And now we get to the Roman councils or the little Lateran councils. So let's look at those. Now, somehow we emerge from this dark age. An emperor, ah, now by the way, from when I speak of emperors now, I will no longer be, unless I specify, I will no longer be speaking of Byzantine emperors, but rather of holy Roman emperors. And when we speak of the empire now, we mean the holy Roman empire, which is essentially Germany, Austria, Hungary, some Slavic bits, Moravia, Moldavia, and so forth, and Northern Italy, and a good chunk of Eastern France are all part of this, which is the holy Roman empire, which is the descendant of the empire of Charlemagne, or one of them, you get the idea? So when you read Dante and he speaks of emperor, that's the empire he means. And here when we speak of emperors, we mean the Holy Roman Emperor, who is also king of the Germans. And there's a reforming emperor, Henry III, who calls a, a synod in which he deposes all three claimants to the papacy. This is in the 10 hundreds. We got to that point, three, three claimants to the papacy. He installs just one, he, pick, he, he compels the clergy of Rome to vote one, and this would lead to the great age of reforms with the great reforming popes. Leo IX, who will reign from 1049 to 1054. Nicholas II, the great Gregory VII, who reigns from 1073 to 1085. Hildebrand, great reformer of the church. Things are looking a lot better now. And... Here are the abuses that need reform, and we're going to see these at many councils from now on. Simony, the practice of paying to be ordained priest or, or bishop. Incontinence of clergy, him meaning clerics, subdeacons, deacons, priests, bishops, having concubines, or even wives. This was an abuse. And both of these abuses were facilitated by the big issue of the Middle Ages, which council upon council is going to deal with, namely lay investiture. Now, lay investiture is the practice whereby the secular authority, king, duke, count, invests a new bishop or new abbot with his crook, you know, the crozier, and his ring. And the reason why this had developed is because abbots and bishops are also in the secular sphere the equivalent to lords. They meaning that you know they have estates, belong to the church for which they run, and they are vassals 
in the feudal system. And so it makes sense that the king would invest them in some way as secular rulers. But where it's not so good is that since the sign of office of a bishop is this crook and ring, that's what they would give them. But these things represent spiritual authority, and that's no good. And also, what's no good about it is that the king, of course, is going to require a small payment for the favor, and that is going to promote simony. And it also is going to attract people who are not fully committed to a service to the church, hence the concubinage. So lay investiture has to be got rid of in order for us to get rid of all these other abuses. Now, we're going to have to wait a bit for councils because at this time there's disagreement about how important or what the authority of a council is. Is it superior to the Pope? The Popes, in a way, had to prove their worth before they were able to call a council. And in addition to the reforming Popes who really were able to do a lot of good, the three men I mentioned, Urban II, when he called the Crusade, that acquired him a lot of prestige. And it acquired a lot of prestige for the papacy and allowed for a successor of his within about 20 years to call Lateran I. Now, Lateran I takes place in the year 1123 in the Lateran Basilica in Rome. And uh, it, the, pal the Pope's palace is right next door. He, his Lateran council, the Pope could attend them in his slippers. He could just walk through from his bedroom through a hallway, and there he was in the church. There had been an assembly after much fighting between the emperor Henry IV and his son Henry V and the popes over who gets to give the ring and the staff, in other words, the authority to, to bishops and abbots. There was a diet, which means is, is, a, is a word for a, a great assembly of nobles and bishops in the Holy Roman Empire in the town of Worms. And these was called the Diet of Worms. A concordat was passed separating investiture by church and investiture by secular authorities, whereby the secular authorities could confer lay regalia, secular regalia, indicating jurisdiction. But the church invested these bishops and abbots with the ring and the staff and the mitre and all the things that really are strictly spiritual in nature. Lateran I endorses this concordat of worms, and that it on paper puts an end to that, although, of course, it's, all abuses continue. Lateran I repeats the condemnation of all the abuses, abuses of the day. In a very medieval touch, it reminds knights who like to fight each other that there's a truce of God, no fighting Thursday through Sunday, and no fighting until after Mass when you do fight on the other days, which made Europe a peaceful place to the extent that this was obeyed. Indulgences for crusaders are given out. People who rob pilgrims on their way are excommunicated, some house cleaning. In many ways, it was a necessary council. 16 years later only, the next council, the 10th, Lateran II, and that assembles in 1139. And this has to do not with wrangling with a, uh, an emperor this time, but wrangling with an antipope. What is an antipope? It is not someone who's against the papacy. On the contrary, an antipope is someone who likes the papacy so much that he thinks he has it without being it. All right. So in other words, a fake pope. And what had happened is that 16 cardinals, mostly French, had elected a man by the name of Gregory Papareschi as Innocent II, which was legitimate. But then later, during the pontificate of Innocent II, another group of cardinals, some of them changed their minds, some of them hadn't voted for Innocent II to begin with, voted for someone else, Anacletus II, nicknamed the Ghetto Pope, because he was reputed to have had Jewish ancestors who lived in the Borghetto, which is the neighborhood where the Jews lived, the Ghetto, Borghetto, Ghetto, the Ghetto Pope. And as often happens with schisms, and we're going to see more of those next week, Who's the real pope? The king of Sicily supported Anacletus II, false pope. But Ber St. Bernard of Clairvaux, the great saint of this period, 
if you've ever read anything by him, you know what I mean, supports Innocent II, as does the Holy Roman Emperor. Now, the schism ends with the death of Anacletus the Antipope in 1138. But there's still a lot of bad blood because a lot of bishops and some of those cardinals and abbots owe their positions to the Antipope. So what happens to them? The synod is called for this purpose. And what uh, Lateran II does do is to depose all the people who were made bishops and abbots by the Antipope. And it repeats the reformist agenda of Lateran I and the popes before that, plus a number of other items that allow us really to take a look into the Church of the Middle Ages in this way. It prohibits usury. It prohibits tournaments, you know, jousting. It prohibits the study of law and medicine by monks, because some of these monks were becoming lawyers and doctors just to make a little extra money on the side instead of praying. It declares the marriages of clergy from subdeacons up to be invalid. In other words, these people were marrying, you see. That's an abuse. And it condemns some emerging heresies, some that rejected the Eucharist, some that rejected infant baptism, rejected the priesthood and marriage. Heresies are beginning to emerge here. It condemns a man by the name of Arnold of Brescia, who had tried to cause a revolution in Rome and found a republic. And he, among other ideas, believed that property ownership was no good, that clerics who owned property could not enter heaven. So he was condemned and actually ultimately hanged. So more reform. Then we get to Lateran III. We're taking a whirlwind tour here of these councils. That's in 1179, so just 40 years later. And this time, it's conflict with the Holy Roman Emperor that brings it about. And this Holy Roman Emperor was kind of a phenomenal man. His name was Frederick I, nicknamed Barbarossa, the red bearded, although he didn't always have a beard. Some of the statues of him, he just has a mustache. He was an amazing man. The, his contemporaries nearly thought he was superhuman. He was tall. He lived longer than most people lived. He knew many foreign languages. And he restored Roman law to the Holy Roman Empire. And in doing so, he tried to infringe on the rights of the church. And so he is born in 1122, dies in 1190. So there's going to be a clash. At the conclave, when the new pope is elected, Barbarossa intervenes and opposes the candidacy of the front runner, whose name was Roland Bandinelli. Why? Because this Roland Bandinelli had shown himself to be very independently minded when it came to secular affairs. And so Barbarossa supports another pope. Cardinal Octavian, okay. Now, Bandinelli does win the election anyway, takes the name Alexander III, and the big dispute, though, is the dispute over northern Italy, because the papal states are in Italy, of course, and the Holy Roman Empire, as I mentioned, extended over the Alps and into northern Italy. Think of Milan, Venice, Turin, all in the Holy Roman Empire, and there was always throughout the, this period, border disputes between the papal states and the Italian cities of the Holy Roman Empire. And furthermore, there was the issue of who administers these areas when the emperor has died and there's no emperor, or when the pope has died and there's no pope, and each of them tried to take more. They're always fighting over these northern states, and that comes out in Dante's Inferno as well. That's why there are, Dante will be always pro-empire, and that's why he puts a bunch of popes in the hot place, and why he puts uh, Justin, Justinian, the emperor, in, uh, in paradise. It's all part of this empire versus papacy. So this is what's going on here. And Barbarossa, though, is going to hang on to his antipope for 15 years, and his successor, too. Finally, there's a peace is reached in which he agreed to restore to the church the property he had taken away. This is Barbarossa. And part of this peace agreement is called the Peace of Venice was, and the Pope will call a council, which he does. And that is going to be Lateran III in 1179. And it's meant to firm up this new peace between empire and papacy. 
And it stipulates, but it also does a lot of house cleaning. For example, it promulgates that it takes a two-third majority to vote for a pope among the cardinals. This is a rule that still exists to this day. It also says that you have to be 30 years of age to be made a bishop. That law is still with us today. It also says that no man can have more than one ecclesiastical position. You can't be bishop of two dioceses, an abbot of three abbeys, and then pastor of this. No, just one. That will remain a dead letter until Trent and beyond. And that's going to be another abuse. It works to improve knowledge in the church. It declares that every cathedral should have a schoolmaster. So there's be a school, at least in the cathedral city, there are more cathedral cities than, than today, to sort of raise the level of education, at least among the clergy, but also among the children of the place. The Cathars, this new heresy, they're also called Albigensians, they're Gnostics, they have very nasty practices, they're excommunicated. Christians are not allowed to sell weapons to the Muslims who've been buying Christian weapons then to attack them. So house cleaning. And then there's a 36-year break, and now we come to the Great Council Lateran IV. This is a big deal council. It takes place in 1215, and the Pope who calls it is the Great Innocent III. And Innocent III is a massively important Pope. In fact, believe it or not, you can buy action figures of Innocent III. All right, that's how he's even influenced popular culture and by your niece or nephew or, or grandson, an action figure of, of, uh, of this great pope. And this also is the high point of papal power in the Middle Ages. Sometimes that's been exaggerated, as we shall see. Now, Innocent has a number of, Innocent III has a number of items to his agenda. That he, it's really his council, it is true. Although, he works at the council, there's some give and take with the bishops. He sends out invitations in 1213 to all the bishops of the Christian world, including the Greeks of the Patriarchate of Constantinople, which at this time, by the way, is a Latin patriarchate, not to get into too much detail, but since 1204, there's a Latin empire in Constantinople and a Latin patriarch. But, you know, the local bishops and things are still Greeks. They don't, they don't come. However, other new Christian nations or relatively new Christian nations do send bishops. Bohemia, Hungary, Poland, Lithuania, Estonia. And so here you really do have a feeling for this ecumenical aspect. The emperor sends representatives, as do the kings of France, England, Aragon, Northern Spain, Hungary. The crusader states, there are crusader states now, they send representatives. St. Dominic and St. Francis, they're, they're young men at this time. They come. In fact, St. Dominic dreams of St. Francis before meeting him. He has a vision. Our Lady presents him this man whom he recognizes the next day. Well, St. Francis, I saw you in a dream. And they fall into each other's arms and they, they become very good friends because they're both involved in reforming the church through the foundation of their new orders. This council, as important as it is, was very short. Three sessions only all in November 1215. It issued 70 chapters, capitula, which is the Latin way of singing canons. It's just paragraphs of items. You know. We don't have any of the minutes of this council. By the way, for a lot of these councils, our information is actually quite sparse. Sometimes we only have lists of these canons because they're in someone's cathedral. You know, They were sent to everyone and they just happened to be somewhere. So for this one, we don't have any of the discussions or minutes or it, just the canons. And this council does promulgate doctrine, unlike the little latrines, which don't really do so except in the combination of some little heresies. It promulgates an expanded creed against the Albigensian Cathars, who believe that, uh, I don't know how to summarize what they believe, but they were Manichaean, they believe that God and the devil were co-equal, and that the church, our church, is the church of the devil. Okay. It teaches transubstantiation. There it is. Transubstantiation. I think I've got it right. It's a long, difficult word. Namely, that at mass, the bread and the wine 
do in fact become substantially the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the church has always believed this. You can go back to the very early fathers. But the word itself had never been promulgated as the word that, dif- that is the right label for what happens. It condemns the errors of Joachim of Fiore, who believed that there were three ages cons- corresponding to the three person of the Trinity, and that the age of the Holy Ghost was upon us. He's condemned. And because of these new heresies, it begins to legislate the Holy Inquisition to look into the spread of heresy, particularly in the south of France, around Toulouse, Albi, and other places. One of the hallmarks of this council is how commonsensical and realistic it is. In other words, the new disciplinary laws that it promulgates are very commonsensical. Example, Chapter, we would say Canon 21, says every Christian must confess his sins and receive communion at least once a year. And by the way, this rule is still today's rule. Because they say, well, should it be every Sunday? No. Once a month? Well, for some people, it's hard to get to Mass and confession hard to. So anyway, okay, let's just keep it once a year. It addresses the duties and rights of all levels of the church and later it tells every, it reminds everyone of all their duties and, and uh, rights in the church. It promotes pastoral ministry. It says, for example, that no Episcopal see may remain vacant longer than three years, meaning if the bishop dies, you can't let more than three years elapse before you replace him. A lot of dioceses have been kind of abandoned. this so, way. no, we have to tight, keep things tight. Cathedrals must have preachers and confessors. Instruction to the people, meaning sermons, must be given in the language of that people. Because you do that because, you know, there's people traveled and you might have a Bohemian preaching to Moravians in a different language, or you might have an Italian preaching to people in Paris in Italian, or you might have some ivory tower type theologians who who just preach in Latin, even when they're of supplementing a sick priest someplace for his mass. No, preach in the language of the people. It demands provincial synods so that bishops of regions can get together and hash out their mutual problems. Cathedrals must have, again, school teachers, masters of grammar, metropolitan churches, which have jurisdiction over other dioceses, must have a doctor of theology to instruct the clergy. It tightens up marriage law, no more clandestine marriages. Well, It makes clandestine marriages, meaning without witnesses or a priest, illicit, although they remain valid for a while more. It seeks to suppress fraudulent relics and pilgrimages, because some of those had arisen. It was kind of a market for fake relics, and the church says, no, we have to put an end, that's an abuse. And furthermore, excessive usury is forbidden. And here's a chapter that it cannot be mentioned without some embarrassment. Muslims and Jews who live within Christendom must wear distinctive garb. They have to dress differently to Christians. And the specific reason alleged for this is because too many Christian men and women have mistakenly ended up marrying Jews and Muslims without knowing it. So in some way they have to be they have to look different. Now there are all sorts of unintended consequences when you compel a minority to dress distinctly, okay. That was not the intention, but it didn't help the situation of the Jews or even the Muslim minority who lived among Christians. And that's why I say some of those disciplinary things that councils promulgated are not necessarily the best ideas that could ever issue from a council. All right. It also proposed a crusade, another one, along with the means to undertake it, a 5% tax on all clergy. And this crusade will take place, but will fail. And he rejected the Magna Carta. So some of you who are historians of law and liberties and rights and things, well, a council of the church condemned the Magna Carta. So, And that's a disciplinary issue. It's not like it's doctrinal. It confirmed Frederick as Holy Roman Emperor. Frederick II now, the, the descendant of the other one. And that's it for that. Now we have to spring forward. So that's... Lateran fall. Transubstantiation is kind of the crowning glory of that particular thing. Oh, and also it said no more new religious orders. We've got enough. 
But the Dominicans and the Franciscans had managed to squeak right under the wire. And for a while, we're not going to see new religious orders. It's true. We do get those great uh, religious orders, thank God. So much for Lateran Four. The 13th Council <laughs> is the First Council of Lyon, primatial see of the Gauls. This one takes place in 1245. 13th Council, so 13 now. And it's the first of three councils that are going to take place in what we call France today. At the time, it wasn't France. It was part of the Holy Roman Empire. But the people there speak a Latin language, and you know. And so once again, there's bad blood between Pope and Emperor. Frederick II, the very Frederick II who'd been confirmed as Emperor 30 years before at Lateran IV, hasn't been very grateful to the church because he's turned against her. And so there the clash is between Innocent the Fourth. now. It gets confusing when they all have the, you know, these names. It gets worse later on, by the way. Innocent the fourth versus Fred, I'll call him Fred the second, right? That's where it is. And again, it had to do with the rights of the empire versus the papacy in Northern Italy to such an extent that he tried to catch Innocent the fourth, like arrest him. Innocent the fourth escapes via Genoa by boat to France, up the Rhone River, makes it to Lyon. Now you might say, but isn't Lyon in the Holy Roman Empire? And isn't he trying to flee from the emperor? But Lyon, you see, because the Holy Roman Empire, by the way, was increasingly becoming a mosaic of quasi-independent principalities and kingdoms. And Lyon, the prince of Lyon, was also the archbishop of Lyon, and of course was pro-papal, so it was safe. And so it is in the fourth said, I have to, I, I'm going to organize a council. That's my defense against this, this emperor. So he sends out the invitations in January of 1245, Lots of people come, Spanish bishops, Italian bishops, French bishops, not so many German bishops, because the Holy Roman Emperor had made it illegal to go to the council. So he's trying to get in the way. But this is merely an occasion or an opportunity for a council. There were, in fact, things that needed to be settled, and it's always the same stuff, it seems. And Innocent IV gives a beautiful sermon on the wounds of the church. Five wounds. Our Lord had five wounds. The church has five wounds, and in every age and time, those can be a bit different. The five wounds of the church, as he saw them, are the following. The sins of the clergy, so, which were pretty much what you can expect. Uh, simony was around, but also concubinage, incontinence, and even the unnatural vice was around in those days. Okay? And the Pope felt that we have to put an end to that, so that's one. Number two, the loss of Jerusalem to the Muslims. In 1244, the Muslims had taken Jerusalem. Three, the difficulties of the Latin Empire of Constantinople. Four, a new race of infidel men are putting pressure on Europe, the Mongols. Remember, the Mongols make it all the way to Poland, and they're not Christians. We'll get back to them. And of course, the fifth wound is Frederick II, who's persecuting the church, whom the Pope suspects of heresy. And he attack, He says that he, he allies with the infidels. And I mean, indeed, so for example, here's one of the things that Frederick II did. There'd been a synod in the Lateran, one of those um, Lent Easter synods in 1241. So uh, four years before, because we're in 1245 now for this council. And the emperor had just arrested and put in the dungeon 100 of the bishops who were going to that synod. That's Frederick II. So those are the things they're going to deal with. And they deal with other things besides. Like tightening up procedures and church tribunals. Money is set aside for defensive works in the east of Europe against the Mongols. Another 5% tax is imposed upon churchmen to defend the Christians of the Holy Land, which is shrinking. Well, the Christian kingdoms are shrinking over there. And also, this is kind of an aside, a little thing. This is the council, so Lyons in 1245, at which uh, it is decreed that cardinals should wear a red hat. One of those little things. So that's where that is formalized. So were they able to do anything with the emperor? Yes. 
they declare him a heretic, and they de it declares him deposed. And by the way, part of the clash between kings and but particularly emperors and pope, is that the popes of the Middle Ages will consider themselves to be king of kings and to be able to install and depose emperors at will. And in this council, uh, Innocent IV certainly availed himself of that particular political doctrine and said, well, I declare him to be deposed as king of the Germans and as Holy Roman Emperor. And indeed, that put an end to a great dynasty. Frederick II belonged to this dynasty, the Hohe and Staufen dynasty. And that is going to be the beginning of the end of that particular dynasty. And it is going to contribute to the breakup of the Holy Roman Emperor. The next council, 37 years later, Second Council of Lyons, Lyon, 14th Ecumenical Council, that takes place in 1274. Pretty important one. Now, 1274, we're getting into the really the beautiful high Middle Ages. This is the age of cathedrals. This is the age of scholastic philosophy. 1274 is the year that St. Thomas Aquinas dies. In fact, he dies on his way to the council where he was supposed to help out with theology. So that's where we are, okay, in terms of the history of the church. And um, it's called by Gregory X who actually was elected, when he was elected, he was elected in absentia, he was in the Holy Land. And so this Pope Gregory X is very much orientated, so to speak, to the Orient. Uh, the Muslim threat, but also union with the Greeks, even though the Crusader states are a lost cause by now, but he may not have been completely aware of it. And reunion with the Greeks is on everyone's mind because the Greeks have taken Constantinople back from the Latins. The Latins, through a crusade that went awry in 1204, took Constantinople, and they stay there for 61 years or. And he invited all the powerful uh, people, church and state, in Christendom. He even invited the king of Armenia, and the ruler of the Mongols, the Mongol Khan. Now, the king of Armenia didn't come, neither did the Mongol Khan, but they did send representatives. And this is remarkable because that's, those are people from very far away and they do show up. And he, at the beginning of the council, actually Innocent III had done this at Lateran IV too, he quotes our Lord. The first speech the Pope gives to all these assembled ambassadors and bishops and abbots is with desire I have desired to eat this Pasch with you. That's Luke 22, 15. Those are the words of our Lord to the apostles at the Last Supper. With desire have I desired. So that's kind of how they see it. It's kind of a new Holy Thursday. And some other councils are going to be seen, by the way, as new Pentecost. That certainly had been the case for the Council of Nicaea. Uh, it had been understood as being a... Uh, a new Pentecost. And part of what, what makes a council a new Pentecost is precisely that people come from all over the place. Just at Pentecost, when there's a whole list there in the book of Acts on all the regions of the world from which people had come to be preached to by the apostles. The agenda was threefold. The relief of Jerusalem, he increases the tax on clergy to 10% to help the Holy Land. Not going to work too much. In fact, Acre, the last stronghold, in the Holy Land falls at just this time. Union with the Greeks. Now the Greeks arrive a bit late, they do come. We have a former patriarch of Constantinople whose name is Germanus, who is not listed. If you go on the Orthodox Whippy, they, they, they skip him because he came and ascended to Rome. They don't like him very much. The Archbishop of Nicaea came and the, the Chancellor of the Emperor of Byzantium came. And they came to an agreement on the basic things that normally divide us from the Greeks. The primacy of Rome, they assent to it. The existence of purgatory, they say yes. They agree on there being seven sacraments. And after all these agreements, they followed a mass, celebrated first in Latin and then in Greek. And at the time that they recited the creed, the filioque, that particular stumbling block was recited even by the Greeks. 
Now, they were also granted permission to use the creed as they had always done. They didn't have to use the filioque all the time, but they did on this occasion to manifest their assent. But this reunion, it won't be the last, did not live long because it turned out that agreement to the Roman positions was a minority position and the folks back home were in no mood to reunite with Rome. And so, alas, we didn't get it. Now, it has to be said also that Rome is somewhat guilty here too, because one of the next popes after this council, Martin IV, who reigns from 1281 to 1285, was in favor of the King of Naples conquering Constantinople and taking it back for the Latins. So you can see how the Greeks might be a bit skittish about allying themselves with the papacy. And this is also, just as an aside, when the King of France surrenders a little chunk of France to the Papal States. And that chunk of France is going to grow a little bit and to include Avignon, as a matter of fact, as part of the Papal States. Also, one member of the Mongol delegation asked to be baptized before he went home. So that's kind of an astounding little detail of the spread of the gospel. Last one for tonight, the Council of Vienne. Now, as I mentioned, Vienne, and this council takes place over a couple of years. So as I mentioned, this is not the Vienna of Austria. It's a town just south of Lyon. And it's called by Clement V. Now, who's Clement V? His name was actually Raymond Bertrand de Gotte. He was a Frenchman. This is important for the rest of the story. He's elected in 1305. He had been the Archbishop of Bordeaux, which means that he was a subject to the King of England because Aquitaine, where Bordeaux is, this is the, the part of that, that period of time, you know, the story of Joan of Arc, for example, and the Hundred Year War, when Bordeaux was part of the English kingdom. And yet, as a Frenchman, he was not so much a friend of the English, but he was a good friend of the King of France, whose name was Philip the Fourth called Philip the Fair. Apparently he was a good looking fellow and we have paintings of him, but it was a kind of beauty that fades as soon as you met him because he was such an intense and slightly odd person. He would stare at you unblinkingly that he would sort of make you take a couple of steps back. And he also was a man of iron will. And this council is a difficult one, why? Because Philip the Fourth had had wranglings with a recent former Pope, Boniface VIII. Philip the Fair was at war with England. This is the Hundred Year War. He needed money, desperately. And he intended to tax the clergy for his own purposes. Boniface VIII had issued a bunch of bulls. The first one was called, these are documents. Well, the first one was called Ausculta Fili, which means listen, son. And then another one called clericis like, or saying, lay people listen to clergy, listen to me, king. And the other one, Udam Sanctam, which said that to be saved, you must be subject to the Pope. And you're not subject to me, Philip, because you're disobeying me. Okay? So those three balls, and then, okay, Boniface VIII died, but Philip the Fair wanted Boniface VIII to be dug out of the ground and put on trial for heresy. Okay? So that's the kind of man he was. Now, Clement V who's crowned in Lyon, and then will move to Poitiers. He has zero desire to go to Rome. In fact, Rome at the time is not a really good place to go. Why? It's been overrun by brigands. St. John Lateran, the cathedral and the palace adjoining it, have burnt to the ground. And so he, Clement V as well, I'll just settle in that part of, my, of the Papal States, which are within France. And that's where he settles in this place called the Comte Venessin, which the papacy had uh, acquired just in the last council. And ultimately, for the next 67 years, the popes will live not in Rome, but in Avignon, and they will all be French, and, all the, and nearly all the cardinals will be French, and it's going to take on a very French you. And to this day, if you like wine, you may have heard of Chateauneuf du Pape, which is from a village where the Pope's go, it means the Pope's Newcastle. Anyway, and 
among the first acts of Clement V is to withdraw all those bulls that Boniface VIII had issued against Philip the Fair. And in consultation with the King of France, he summons a council and the king helps him decide whom to invite. It takes place in Vienne. And the agenda is the following. Dealing with the Templars, Philip the Fair wanted to suppress the Templars to take their money because they were the American Express of the Middle Ages and had a lot of money. He couldn't get money out of Boniface VIII, so perhaps if he suppresses the Templars, he could get their money. Trumped up charges, as we now know, are raised against the Templars, accusing them of blasphemy, of heresy, of unnatural vices, and he gets their bank. He doesn't get all their holdings, but he does get their bank. And the, this council suppresses the Templars, but it does not condemn them for any crimes. It just says, for the good of the church, we suppress the Templars. It says nothing of their guilt. It deals with certain movements in the Francis. Some of the Franciscans were becoming a little off doctrinally. It deals with that. In terms of recovering the Holy Land, there's a change at this council. Namely, rather than trying to raise funds for a crusade, they say, no, well, we have to just convert the Muslims, not fight them. And so it, there's one canon that promulgates that there should be a chair of Greek and Hebrew and Arabic to prepare missionaries to preach in the Orient to the Jews and to the Arabs, the Muslims. Didn't quite work out, there were enough teachers. And they never do dig up Boniface. Philip will have to be happy, content with the suppression of the Templars. And then, so this council ends. The popes are now in Avignon. And that's kind of it. So quick conclusion. We've seen the break with the, the Oriental Church in the Eighth Council, Constantinople IV. Remember with Photius. After that, with the literal, I beg your pardon, with the little Lateran councils, and then the big Lateran Council, the fourth in 1215, with the two Lyon councils and the Council of Vienne, we see councils more or less guided by the Pope, papal councils. Very diverse participants we've seen, uh, including representatives of secular states who could make their voices heard. Another important thing is that the canons and chapters of these councils were often be promulgated into canon law, some of which exists to this day. And the last thing, we can kind of see that the Pope has been increasingly the man in charge in the church, but this is going to be questioned. And we'll see later, a later council is going to have to deal with the notion that a council can be superior to the Pope and can depose him and can tell him what to do. And that's going to be cleaned up at a very messy council, the Council of Constance. There, thank you for your extra patience. That's as far as I can go tonight. <laughs> well, we, don't. we won't be seeing so many councils in our next few lectures, but this one we really have to go fast. Oh, well, thank you so much, Dr. Pepino. Eight councils, if I'm counting correctly. In I think that's lecture. right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ooh, that's a lot. But who uh -huh. knew there were so many, right? You may have heard there were many, 21, and what were they? Well, four in the Lateran. By the way, there'll be a fifth one in the Lateran, which we shall see. Mm -hmm. And then after that, once we're done with the fifth Lateran Council of 1517, we'll have Trent and Vatican I. These are great, sober, doctrinal councils. And then Vatican II, the council under whose shadow we all live. And some of us here may, in fact, have been walking the earth at the time of that council. So that brings it really close to home. Dr. Pepino, would you be willing to close us out? Yes, with the doxology of the Trinity, of course, which uh, the early council spent so much time and energy defending and teaching. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son. Amen. And good night. We hope you enjoyed this program from the Institute of Catholic Culture. Remember to download our app and share our online library with friends, co-workers, and family members. To learn more, get involved, and support the Institute's work, visit instituteofcatholicculture.org and visit us on social media.